So welcome to the Better Birth Podcast. Today we are going to be discussing cord blood banking and all things related to Anja Health, why I started Anja Health, and just how we can help support pregnant parents in the future have better births. So Catherine, you're not usually the type of founder that shares a ton about your personal life, but today we're going to get into it. So tell me, how did you get here? How did you get started? What's your family background? <laughs> yes, yeah, so um, yeah, I basically found founded Anja Health because of my younger brother, Andrew. So when I was three and he was one, he walked into a lake and that resulted in him having brain damage and then getting diagnosed with cerebral palsy. And so um, my family began looking into treatments for cerebral palsy and found that cord blood stem cells was something that was really promising. So at Duke University, there's a researcher, Dr. Joanne Kurtzberg, and she basically has been using cord blood stem cells to treat kids with cerebral palsy and has been able to see motor and social skill improvements in those kids. And so my family began looking for cord blood stem cells that we could use for my brother in the same way. Um, so essentially my mom tried to find a match because we didn't have my own cord blood stem cells or my brother's, but it was really difficult to find a match. And it's normally difficult if you're a person of color or mixed race at all. Mm -hmm. um, and we're half Chinese and half white. So um, overall we couldn't find a match ultimately. And um, yeah, and then my brother passed away. So so I wanted to do something that would have been able to impact him. So I founded Anja Health and named after my brother, Andrew. Um, so that's where the name came from. Very nice. Very sweet. <laughs> <laughs> so this sounds like it involves a lot of complicated um, scientific knowledge. How did you get into that? Did you study science in college? Mm. No, I actually didn't. I studied media arts and sciences, which was like computer science and art. Mm -hmm. And then I did a minor in economics because I'd always been interested in business, but also digital design and media. So marketing has always been kind of my focus. Um, but we have quite a few medical advisors and also a really keen lab director um, and lab partner that we work with. So um, they are able to really support me with everything that's more science related and medically inclined. Um, and I focus on everything marketing related. So I still do have to have a really deep understanding of the science, especially because I talk about it so much when it comes to stem cell research and um, just the healthcare industry in general. So I do try to stay up to date with things that are happening. Um, but yeah, my main interest is in marketing and social media, and I just wanted to have a broader impact. Um, so then my yeah main interest is honestly bettering births for parents and making sure that we can provide the best experience for them um, and that they have an informed birth experience. Because I think a lot of people walk into birth feeling really uninformed and there's a lot of noise and not a lot of signal. Mm -hmm. um, but we want to provide really, really clear resources through things like our community um, for parents and also our blog and social media in general, um, including what they can do with their umbilical cord and placenta. Because I think that particular part of birth is really, really underestimated. and and rarely talked about. That's great, yeah. I feel like a lot of people actually don't know a ton about the birthing process or all the different components that could benefit uh, your health or your baby's health afterwards. So I would love to hear more about the process of cord blood stem cell banking. How does that work exactly? Yeah, yeah, so basically we have a kit that parents can order um, and we ship it to parents at around 30 weeks if they order it before then, or we can also get a kit to them really, really quickly if they're giving birth soon. Like we once had a mom order a kit when she was four centimeters dilated. Wow. Um, so we can literally get it to them in the matter of hours, but we do definitely suggest planning ahead. Um, but yeah, we will send a kit right to parents' doorsteps and basically they just make that a part of their birth bag and take it with them to birth. So inside of the kit, it contains all of the materials that you'll need to be able to collect stem cells right at birth. So it basically has what's equivalent to a blood bag for the cord blood. Um, so there's a needle at the end and basically you can just stick it into the umbilical cord and blood will flow. And then we have two jars for the cord tissue, AKA the cord itself, and then another bigger jar for the placenta. Mm -hmm. And it's an insulated box and can maintain uh, the stem cells at room temperature for up to 72 hours. So um, yeah, basically when parents bring it to birth, they just let their provider know that they have it and that they do definitely want to bank cord blood, cord tissue, and mm -hmm. or the placenta. 
and basically um, they the provider can collect using our instructions, but it's pretty simple. Like I said, just putting the needle in the cord and then placing the cord and placenta in the jars, and then you can just box it up. And then we have a phone number on our kit um, and also a form if you would like to just place it via place the pickup via our portal. Um, but basically you can place the pickup as a parent and we will come to wherever you are. We've picked up from homes after home births, um, hospital rooms. We have a courier that will come directly to where you are within 12 hours or less. And especially if you're in a more urban area, then we'll come really, really soon. Mm -hmm. Um, and basically they will pick it up and bring it to our lab, which is based in New Jersey. And that is where we freeze and process all of the stem cells. Um, so that whole lab process is kind of equivalent to freezing eggs and sperm. Wow. So you mentioned home birth. So in the case that someone did have a home birth and there isn't necessarily a medical professional there, uh, how does that work exactly? Yeah. So whenever someone does a home birth, um, they typically have a midwife mm -hmm. or like someone helping them facilitate the home birth. Um, and so because the process of collecting stem cells is so simple, we've had midwives at home births um, just follow our instructions, basically, and essentially collect um, for the parents. So it doesn't even have to be a physician. Like I would honestly feel comfortable doing it because it's so simple. Um, but we do offer the opportunity to train your provider if they feel like they would need it. And we send notices to OBGYNs typically beforehand um, that this patient is indeed collecting stem cells at birth so that they get a sense of instructions beforehand and are just um, briefed on what to do. But for the most part, like most midwives and OBGYNs have seen it at least once before and mm -hmm. have even done it themselves. Um, but yeah, like I said, it's, it's super simple. It's just a matter of finding the umbilical cord vein, which is very clear. It's typically blue on the umbilical cord and you can just stick it in and gravity will just let the blood flow into the bag. You can sort of milk the cord to make sure that all of the blood is getting into the bag properly. Um, and then the placenta and cord tissue, we just cut, um, it's about around six to 10 inches um, of the cord tissue and then the whole placenta and you can just stick it in the jar and then wrap it up. Um, and then we also collect samples typically of the birth parents' blood as well because we'll screen it for disease. Mm -hmm. um, and so we get four vials of that. Um, but yeah, like I said, normally a nurse midwife can do that. Um, and yeah, then just call for pickup. So is this accessible to everyone in the country? So yes, theoretically, any parent that is pregnant can bank cord blood, cord tissue, or placenta stem cells. Um, sometimes we have parents reach out about their own medical history. If they personally have HIV, for instance, then in those cases, we wouldn't necessarily recommend banking cord blood stem cells because then um, the stem cells themselves could also potentially have it. But um, yeah, but for the most part, like even some diseases wouldn't necessarily transfer to the umbilical cord and placenta. Um, and yeah, we try to make it as accessible as possible. Um, like typically this is seen as something for the top 1% um, and other companies tend to market it as such, but we really try to ensure that we have payment plans, for instance, that can get um, parents that aren't as high income on board. So we do our best to make sure that we can reach those that do want to do it. Um, and we've kind of had like a variety of parents, literally in every single state, we've had a parent bank with us, um, even Alaska and Hawaii. So we can definitely pick up from there as well. Um, and we've had like teen moms and like older moms. So um, yeah, I think we hope that it's definitely something that every single parent that's expecting considers. Yeah, it'll be cool one day when it's the norm, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let's say you order the kit, you have the blood. What if you wanted to freeze everything at home? So we definitely don't recommend freezing your umbilical cord and placenta at home, mainly because the stem cells won't live. It's sort of similar to like if you wanted to freeze sperm and then you just like stuck it in your freezer, like it wouldn't necessarily work <laughs> properly um, and the sperm wouldn't necessarily survive. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, it really does need to be frozen at negative 190 degrees Celsius in liquid nitrogen or vapor nitrogen. Um, that is how you can freeze biological goods. 
Um, so theoretically, yes, you could take your placenta home and stick it in your deep freezer. I, I've personally spoken with parents that have done that. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's just a misunderstanding, I think, that stem cells can still be preserved that way, but in reality, it really does need to be cryopreserved at extreme temperatures. So that's really important to remember if you're giving birth. Great. That's interesting. So when uh, the so when everything gets sent to the lab, is it processed there? And are you able to make sure that it's maintained? How long is it frozen there? How does yeah. it work? Yeah. So basically, as soon as the kit arrives at our lab, pretty much, we have a lab tech that opens up the kit and begins processing the umbilical cord blood, cord tissue, and the placenta. So it's quite a lengthy processing process. It takes about 48 hours to complete, um, and it they even freeze it in a separate area at first, and then they place it in the vapor nitrogen tank mm -hmm. um, after 48 hours so um, or so. So... Um, yeah, that, so it does definitely take uh, quite a bit. And um, yeah, that processing piece is also important, which is also why we don't recommend that parents freeze their umbilical cord and placenta at home if you want the stem cells. Mm -hmm. So then what happens when eventually, if you do need the stem cells and you would like to retrieve them, what is a uh, parent supposed to do? Yeah, so we've actually had parents already retrieve their own stem cells. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been really exciting. And it's cool because we get a real bird's eye view into the frontier of medicine and what people are doing, um, especially thinking about stem cell science. But yeah, basically when parents want to utilize their stem cells, then they can just reach out to us at Angel Health um, through their parent portal or our helpline. It's always a real person um, and anything like that. And just let us know um, what the use case is and also what physician is administering the treatment. We have a couple of forms that we'll have them fill out to make sure that um, it's all ethical and things of that nature. Um, but yeah, it's the parent's property. So it's really on, up to their own discretion on when and how they would like to use their stem cells. Um, so we definitely recommend sticking to FDA approved related causes and clinical trials and things like that. Um, but we're definitely here as a resource to help parents navigate whether and when they want to use their stem cells. Um, and then we basically transfer it to the physician as long as they have a place to hold it and immediately use it. Okay. So is there a limit to how long uh, you could have your placenta and cord blood frozen? Um, there's not a limit. There isn't any evidence so far that uh, that states that any stem cells would be damaged in any way by continuing to store. So, um, yeah, I think the longest stem cells have been, or the longest stem cells have been frozen is around 25 years, and thus far they haven't had any evidence of damage or anything like that after cryopreservation. Um, so theoretically, you could freeze it for life. Wow. So then in the case that, let's say, a parent or a sibling wanted to use the stem cells afterwards, like it wasn't necessarily for the baby that was born with that blood, if that makes sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, would you be able to use those stem cells? Yeah, yeah. So um, in fact, I think in those cases, it's recommended. Like a lot of siblings use cord blood from another sibling. Mm -hmm. That's like a really, really common use case for umbilical cord blood um, and also placenta stem cells as well. So siblings are a 75% match um, for cord blood stem cells and parents are a 50% match. And um, when they're so intertwined genetically, then the chances that they get host versus graft disease in their body reject a transplant is much, much lower. Mm -hmm. um, and so for that reason, family members should definitely be encouraged to utilize cord blood, cord tissue, and placenta stem cells. Um, so yeah, whenever we're speaking with pregnant parents, we always let them know that it's not even necessarily a safeguard for their baby's health, but a safeguard for maybe even their own or siblings. Um, so yeah, that's really important um, to note. And yeah, for instance, I recently read a study about um, a young boy named Quentin. His He was diagnosed with cancer, and so he, he used his sister's umbilical cord and placenta stem cells um, to help treat his cancer. So, yeah, those sibling use cases are really, really common. And he was, he's black, um, so I think the chances that he would have been able to find a match would be pretty low. Mm. So it's mm -hmm. good that he had his sisters. So what are the types of diseases that stem cells could cure? 
Yeah, so stem cells have uh, not even necessarily cured some diseases, but have mm -hmm. just improved the conditions for them. Um, for instance, real palsy, where they can see motor and social skill improvements, doesn't necessarily cure it, but mm -hmm. can definitely better their quality of life. In certain cases, um, for instance, HIV has been cured in the past with cord blood stem cells. Um, so I believe it was it's been done six times now. Um, where they used cord blood stem cells for HIV. Um, other diseases include different types of metabolic disorders, um, heart disease, uh, liver disease, um, definitely cancer is the most common use case for umbilical cord and placenta stem cells. Mm -hmm. um, but honestly, I think the beauty of working in stem cell science and the industry as a whole is that if you Google stem cells and pretty much any disease, there's usually at least some degree of really, really early or even advanced research um, that demonstrates that it's really promising. Um, so for instance, like when I had a friend get diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, I Googled ulcerative colitis stem cells. And immediately I found a study that demonstrated that cord blood stem cells have been used to treat ulcerative colitis. Um, so then stem cells suddenly became an option. So I feel like the image I always think of in my head when I'm talking about the industry and cord blood stem cells and why it's so important to freeze your umbilical cord and placenta, I think about um, like someone having a list of treatments uh, when they are first diagnosed with a disease and like stem cells just being an additional option. Mm -hmm. um, and so if they have their own stem cells frozen from their family or anything like that, or another family members even, then they can always have that additional option on their treatment plan to at least look into because they have it. <laughs> It sounds like there's an exponential amount of possible uses. <laughs> Indeed. Are there any risks? Um, there aren't any risks, I would say. I feel like the, yeah, the main thing that um, parents have to think about is the financial decision to bank cord blood. Um, so yeah, there aren't any risks to freezing your own umbilical cord and placenta. Um, and I think I would definitely encourage parents to at least consider it. I feel like a big part of birth and pregnancy is that most parents just don't feel informed per se about what to do. Like there's so many different options. Like I feel like it's almost a meme that people have birth plans mm -hmm. because there's so many options and you can't even predict what's going to happen at birth. Um, but basically our goal is to get to the point where whether or not you're going to bank your umbilical cord and placenta stem cells is as commonplace as deciding whether or not you're going to get an epidural. And right now only like a small fraction of parents even know that you can save stem cells from your umbilical cord and placenta. So our goal is to make sure that parents know about that as an option and that they can at least consider it. Mm. So what is the cost exactly? Yeah, so the cost um, for freezing your umbilical cord and placenta is it, depending on what you do want to freeze because you can freeze the umbilical cord blood stem cells. You can also freeze the cord tissue, which is the cord itself. Um, and then you can also freeze the placenta. And so if you do one, two, or three, then it's $49, uh, $79, or $99 a month for eight years, and it covers 20 years of storage. Um, so you get 12 years free, and in that way, um, we're able to support lower income families that want to opt for a payment plan. You can also choose to pay up front, in which case we'll give a discount. Um, and we have various other payment options that parents can opt for, um, but we just try to work with, uh, yeah, different parents' financial situations. Is there a family and friends discount? <laughs> Yes, we do have a variety of discounts, actually. Our most popular discount is a twin discount. Oh. So if you're having twins, you can get your kits for free. So yeah, it's $199 um, to get the kit normally, and then the payment plan separately it starts one month after birth. Um, but yeah, if you're having twins, or we, we'd had triplets once, um, and yeah, then the kits are free if you're having a multiple birth. Um, and we have various discounts for um, repeat customers and yeah, family and friends for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Love to hear it. <laughs> so let's say I bank my blood or um, let's say I bank my cord blood and the placenta stem cells as well. Mm -hmm. What if I wanted to donate them? 
Okay, yes. Yeah. So a lot of people, when they talk about their umbilical cord and placenta, sometimes they can consider the option of donation. Mm -hmm. um, so basically when you donate, you can donate to um, yeah a public bank for cord blood, um, but then it doesn't necessarily guarantee that you'll ever have access to those stem cells again. And I feel like the whole point of banking your own stem cells um, with Angia Health, for instance, is that you will always have access to a genetic match um, for your baby and pot potentially other family members. Um, but if you donate it, then it can definitely help someone probably sooner per se, because there are donors or there, there are patients that are actively looking for donors. Um, for instance, like patients that have leukemia will typically look for a cord blood donor so that they can use someone else's cord blood stem cell in the case that they don't have their own. Um, and so if you donate, then it could potentially help someone for sure. And um, I think Be The Match is an amazing organization that um, advocates for donation. So I definitely don't think it's a bad option, but um, I would just say, yeah, I think in a perfect world, every parent has their own cord blood stem cells banked. Um, for their baby so that every baby has the potential option in the future to utilize cord blood stem cells. And then if they happen to know someone or anything like that that does need it, um, then they can opt to give it to that person then. Um, but yeah, I, I think the worst thing you can do at birth for your umbilical cord and placenta is just throw it away. So I always think like Angia Health's biggest competitor is honestly the biohazard waste bin. Most placentas and umbilical cords are just thrown away. Um, but yeah, you should really consider uh, banking it yourself so that your family always has access to stem cells from your baby's umbilical cord and placenta um, or donating is another great option. Yeah, no waste. <laughs> yes. So if you so if you bank cord blood stem cells, and let's say the parent becomes unwell, is there any way to use the stem cells or have stem cells been used in the past to help heal the parent? Yeah. So yeah. So if you have your own baby stem cells banked, then the parent can definitely use it because parents are a 50% match for their own baby's umbilical cord blood stem cells. Mm -hmm. So we've actually had parents reach out who had things like arthritis or things like that, that they were actively looking for a stem cell match or just considering it as a treatment. And then they're pregnant and all of a sudden they have this really rich resource of stem cells just literally coming out of their body. Mm -hmm. So at that point, um, um, yeah, parents can definitely save stem cells from their baby's umbilical cord and placenta and then potentially tap into that as a treatment option. Wow. So we talked a little bit about, let's say you were to do a home birth, but in the hospital setting, what does that look like? Would you just give the kit to the medical professional or provider? Do they know exactly what the kit is? Uh, do you need to preface it by any by any means. Yeah, yeah, so if you're giving birth soon and you're looking to free stem cells from your umbilical cord and placenta, then, and you're doing a hospital birth or even a birth uh, center birth, then Basically, you just take the kit with you. Generally, providers have heard to some degree of cord blood banking, mm -hmm. so they can just open our kit. We also have instructions inside that are really clear. There's a lot of images and illustrations and just really clear cut instructions on what to do. Um, but yeah, basically a provider or nurse will typically conduct cord blood banking and the process related to that um, right after birth. So basically within minutes, as soon as the umbilical cord and placenta come out, then they will just stick the cord blood bag needle into the umbilical cord vein, watch the blood flow, milk the cord to make sure you get all the blood, then cut off inches of the cord itself and then the placenta, and then just stick it in our kit. And then it's generally the parent's responsibility to call us and let us know that they've given birth and mm -hmm. then we'll come and pick it up from wherever they are. So how does it work letting you know, you mentioned a portal, um, how does it work letting you know that it's ready to pick up? Yeah, so they can also, if they don't want to call us, um, like for instance, I know hospitals are for some reason notorious for having bad reception. <laughs> um, and so <laughs> basically we also have a portal option. So parents can uh, log into their portal, which they have access to as soon as they get a kit. Um, and from there they can just place a pickup. Um, so let us know the address um, that they're at and um, room number or any other instructions that we might need. But it's pretty simple and then they can just submit our form and it automatically places a notification to one of our couriers to come and pick it up. Okay, so is that Anja? Um, yeah, we say Anja Health. Anja. 
Yeah. Anja. Yeah, right? we say Anja House um, because it's named after my brother. So Andrew to Anja. But yeah, typically people will be like Anja or like Anya mm-hmm. or anything like that. But yeah, Anja House. Okay. So why bank with Anja Health? <laughs> Excellent question. <laughs> um, so parents, if you're giving birth soon, should definitely consider banking with Angel House because obviously I'm biased, but I think that Angel House is the main company with a heart and soul that exists um, in the cord blood banking space. So we try to offer really accessible payment options. We also have an amazing community that parents can join and they get automatic access to it if they're banking with us. Mm-hmm. Um and basically our community contains a lot of discounts to like really cool curated prenatal brands and baby brands and things like that. Um, and it also contains access to a variety of providers that are in the community that are potentially available um, to answer different questions or anything like that. And then it's just also a space for parents to even find providers. Like we have a doula matching tool. So we've matched doulas before um, with parents. And yeah, it's just a space for them to connect with other parents as well that are at a similar place in life. Um, And so, yeah, we just try our best to be the most accessible contemporary version. Um, And I think that's really important. Uh, And a company in general that prioritizes user experience, I think is especially important in the perinatal space, because I think when it comes to birth, I think women's health in general is just so underserved Mm -hmm. and the UX is typically so poor for women's health options. And birth is like literally one of the biggest tasks women have to undertake. Um, And yeah, or even like trans men or anything like that or non-binary people. So um, yeah, I think it's just like really important that every single aspect of birth that you can is optimized. Um, So we try to optimize at least the umbilical cord and placenta part and then potentially community part. Where can potential parents find resources and find more information about kits or matching? Yeah, yeah. So if you're currently pregnant, then you can find more information about what to do with your umbilical cord and placenta at anjahealth.com, A-N-J-A health. Um, I also have a TikTok where I talk a lot about cord blood banking and things like that, which is Catherine Anja. So K-A-T-H-R-Y-N-A-N-J-A. Um, and we have a YouTube channel, um, and then this podcast. So the better birth podcast is something that we really prioritize at Ancha health. Um, and we have, yeah, we're literally on every single channel you could think of at Anja health, except on Instagram we're Anja dot but we'll get there. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you pretty well, but <laughs> everyone else may not. Tell me, how did you get from when you were literally born to where you're at right now? (laughs) Okay, so I was born in Boston, Massachusetts, which is ironic because that's where I then went to college, Wellesley College. Shout out. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Stop. Yeah, so I was born in Boston, and yeah, my mom is an immigrant from China. She immigrated when she was 20, and then my dad is from upstate New York. Um, And my dad is a doctor, so then we moved. He was working um, at a hospital in Boston, Boston Children's, and then he got a job at Children's Hospital of Orange County, Chalk, um, and also St. Joseph's, which is also in Orange County. So then we moved to LA. Um, So I grew up in LA, and yeah, I love LA. And then um, I actually wanted to be an attorney for the longest time, Mm -hmm. so like throughout college, I was always like, yeah, I'll just be an attorney. Like, I never even took calculus because I remember my college counselor was like, attorneys don't take calculus. Like, they never need calculus. So I didn't even take calculus. Um, And, yeah, when I first got to Wellesley, I thought to myself, I'll be a peace and justice major because that was a major at Wellesley for some reason. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) And basically... um, Yeah, I flirted with that. I flirted with being a poli-sci major. I flirted with um, being an econ major, an IR econ major. Um, And yeah, we could also cross-register at MIT. So that was really special about Wellesley and Mm -hmm. the education there. But then I was kind of thinking, like, honestly, the most employable things that I could study are related to, like, computer science um, and business. So that's why I chose media arts and science media arts and sciences. I thought it was a good mix of computer science and art. Um, so I could still kind of be in touch with like fashion and things like that, that I've always loved as a hobby. Um, 
And yeah, then I worked as an intern at Goldman Sachs and everyone there in the entire legal division told me not to become an attorney. And so I was like, oh, maybe I shouldn't become an attorney. <laughs> and they were basically like, if you're gonna become an attorney, you have to love the letter of the law. Like so many people become an attorney for the wrong reasons basically, mm. and then they end up hating their job, which I think most of them felt mm -hmm. themselves. And I was like, well, what about like an impact? Like I always wanted to be an attorney to be able to provide an impact. And they were like, you're gonna make no money if you wanna make an impact. And I was like, what about like employment law? Like I feel like a lot of, um, Employment attorneys end up really being able to help people since a lot of like, honestly, human rights violations happen in the workplace. Um, and yeah, and then basically, yeah, I just dropped the idea of becoming an attorney after that internship and then instead reverted to UX design because that's what my major kind of fed into, it tended to feed into digital design. So I was a UX designer slash product designer at Publicis Sapient. Um, which is like a tech consultancy. And then when the pandemic hit in 2020, I um, found my, I still was waiting to start my job um, because my start date got pushed due to the pandemic. And then I basically founded um, this company called Bridge Strategy because I wanted to assemble myself and a bunch of my other friends whose start dates were pushed. And we were all being consultants. So I was like, let's consult for small businesses. So that was my first foray into entrepreneurship. And I realized that I honestly really feel passionate about management um, and just being able to strive and impact that way and like create like real change. Like I felt like I was waking up and like really doing something meaningful every day. Um, so then, yeah, in 2021, I saw on Twitter um, this c company called Launch House and they were basically organizing a bunch of founders in this house. And I was like, well, I'm a founder, I have my consultancy. Um, and then when I got there, they were talking about Silicon Valley a lot. And I literally knew nothing about Silicon Valley. Like I thought that venture capital was like a sector of investment banking, which mm -hmm. I guess it is, but yeah. Um, but I was just so stunned and inspired by all the founders that I met um, living with other founders in this co-living space. And I realized that like, if I really want to step up my game as a founder and, um, and just like create change, like I wanted to like be the change that I wanted to see in the world. <laughs> and, um, and I feel like being a tech founder in Silicon Valley seemed to me to be like the best solution to that. Um, and so, yeah, I, then my, my brother actually passed away like three weeks into me living in this co-living space for founders. And so, um, I think the combination of that happening and the combination of me finding community with other founders and being inspired by what they were doing in Silicon Valley and with tech companies, um, was just like the perfect recipe for me to feel like I should start a business and it should be related to cord blood stem cells because that could have like really impacted my brother's life. Um, and so, yeah, that's what I did. So I quit my job as a product designer and then started this company. Wow. <laughs> it's honestly, it makes kind of sense that you wanted to be a lawyer and I feel like now you're advocating for the use of stem cells. Mm. Yeah. Why do you think it made sense that I want to be a lawyer? One, I think you always look for the best in people. But you like genuinely in your day to day life advocate for their boss best qualities mm. and are able to like promote those or accentuate those in whatever way. Um, and through that, you like bring people together and make sure they're successful as well. Mm. So Aww. it's like you do the same with your business. OK. Yeah. Yes. Agree. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, so tell me, was it difficult to start a company? Um. I didn't find it honestly that difficult to start a company. Um, I just, I think it's hard to find something that you feel passionate enough about um, to start a company. And I think that's where a lot of founders struggle. Like they're kind of like, is this really what I want to do? Like, is it worth quitting my job or whatever? But I think to me, the barometer for like, you should start a business is if you're just like waking up and automatically the first thing you want to do is just like start working. Um, and until you go to sleep to the point that like you kind of forget about other things happening. Like I remember when I was like really in the thick of it working on my consultancy bridge strategy, um, I would literally wake up as soon as I would wake up, I would get on meetings. I would almost like forget to eat and I had to start like creating like real balance in my life and structure. And I remember to like 
they, we had, um, yeah, like a friend fallout basically like happen when I was like really doing bridge strategy. And I just realized that I honestly did not care. I was like, I have my own thing to worry about. I'm working to build my own life. So like if someone doesn't want to be a part of my life for that reason or for, for just like any reason, like I just don't need to spend time worrying about that when like I could spend my time worrying about myself and bettering myself. So I feel like to me, it didn't seem that hard to start a business per se, because as soon as I quit my job and I committed to like, I'm going to found Angel Health, then every day I would wake up and then just start working and like try to like remember to eat and remember to like exercise and these things. Um, and then just like go to sleep feeling so fulfilled and like confident in, in what I was doing. Um, so I feel like, yeah, you just have to start going for it. And like, I think that's made me like really, really execution focused. So I feel like people just have to be execution focused. Like, I think honestly, one of the hardest parts about being a founder at the beginning is just like committing to, I'm going to quit my job and really do this. And then like getting in that execution mode. Um, so yeah, you just have to like get going. Like, um, like Angel House, a part of like Y Combinator and their whole thing is like, make something people want. Like really at the end of the day, you, that's, what it comes down to when you're starting a business, you don't have to think to yourself like, oh, like it's this whole thing and like it's like a big business and like a big like thing you have to like overstep and um, whatever, but it's really at the end of the day just about making something people want. So it's that simple. <laughs> <laughs> that simple, <laughs> easier said than done. Uh, so since you've started the company, what have you learned uh, from Andra Health? I've actually learned so much being a founder. Like I, when I remember when I did bridge strategy for about six months, I wrote a medium article called 21 things I learned starting a business at 21. Um, and I like now I read it a few weeks ago actually. And I was kind of like, all these things seem kind of like the like things to know as a founder. But, um, but I, to me, like it seemed like revelations that I was having um, so yeah, I'm like constantly learning as a founder. Like I think, um, learning how to be like a good manager, uh, across a team, um, learning how to like set a good example for like my teammates, I think was really important. Cause I honestly don't think I was a very good employee actually. Um, and so like, I've kind of had to like think about like what it means to be a good employee, um, and like an employee for myself as well. Um, and yeah, I think one like really tangible skill that I've had to pick up on is just like greater financial literacy. Like I remember it at, in college, like when, since we could cross register at MIT through Wellesley, um, like most of my friends took like managerial finance or like accounting because that's like the main MIT Sloan curriculum. Mm -hmm. And I was, I literally remember thinking to myself, why do so many of my friends take managerial finance? Because like, when would you ever need managerial finance? And now I wish that I took managerial <laughs> finance because it's literally the, the core basis of making something people want is knowing finance because if you if you want to start a business then yeah you need to get your ass up and work <laughs> no but um but if you want to start a business then you you need to know how much how basically you can use money as a quantifier for your making something people want um and yeah if people are willing to pay for it then it's something that they want you mm -hmm. are making something people want and then you have to keep track of like how much revenue you're bringing in, how to spend your money efficiently. Like capital allocation is a real skill that you have to hone um, with the money that you receive or fundraise. Um, and yeah, fundraising is like a whole other thing. So yeah, I just, I feel like I'm like constantly learning starting a business. Like I think a lot of my friends that want to be founders, they tell me that they're waiting to start a business because they feel like they need more work experience, which like, yes, that it probably will benefit you to have work experience. But at the same time, like really the, the best thing you can do if you want to be a founder is just start a company. Like that's the fastest way you'll learn and the best way you'll learn. And even if you have a lot of work experience, then you start a company, you're still not going to know what to do sometimes. So you may as well just start the company if you want to start one. Mm -hmm. What do you think are some of the best decisions and biggest mistakes you've made? Mm, good question. I think the best decision I've made as a founder is starting the business um, and yeah, just going for it. Like I just immediately started setting up the supply chain. 
Um, and yeah, just like moving forward in that way. I think another really good decision is seeking out community, like especially because I'm a solo founder and I don't have co-founders. Um, community is really, really important to me. Like I really, really value the fo other founders that I can look to for advice or even like my exec coach that I had, my therapist, um, my like mom, my friends, um, things like that. I think setting up community is really important. Um, I think another good decision for the company was probably our rebrand. Um, yeah, our designer is really amazing and I feel like, yeah, taking that on and moving forward with that was really good. Um, starting on TikTok was really beneficial. Like, I feel like starting to build a TikTok following was just kind of interesting for me. Um, and yeah, I think biggest mistakes, um, <laughs> I don't know to what extent I can talk about these things publicly. I think my biggest mistakes were related to, um, yeah, I don't know. It's hard to say what my biggest mistakes are as a founder because I think every mistake I like really, really try to learn from. Like I have, mm -hmm. I have a notion, of, a personal notion that I keep that I basically like chronicle every learning that I have. I try to make it like my second brain, which is mm -hmm. a good book um, about like note taking and how to like organize your life. But um, yeah, I, I have one that I, about things I learn in business and every mistake that I make, I really try to take time to reflect on it um, and make sure that I am learning from my mistakes um, I feel like I've probably made quite a few management mistakes and I think, um, yeah, I'm still learning. So I think a better question to ask <laughs> is, <laughs> is there anything that you would have done differently? Mm. Hmm. Knowing what you know now. Yeah. I think knowing what I know now, I think I wish that I took finance seriously earlier on. Like, I, I really, really think that, like, so few founders have a good sense of how to, like, really have accountability on a team, track OKRs and KPIs and align those truly with, like, financial metrics um, and financial analysis. So as a founder, you don't even honestly have to know how to, like, build a P&L, but you have to know how to read one and you have to know what questions to ask in order to, like, properly analyze it. So I, I really do wish that I, I had better financial literacy earlier on. Mm -hmm. So what can we expect from Anja Health in the future? <laughs> in the future, we want at least 10% of births to involve cord blood banking. Um, and we want every single parent to at least have the option of cord blood banking presented to them. So in actually 31 states, it's a legal mandate that pregnant parents know about cord blood banking, and I think it will continue to expand. Um, but yeah, basically like these states have recognized that like it should be at least something presented to parents. Like so many parents, like every time I post a TikTok about cord blood banking, it's like I get flooded with comments along the lines of like, I gave birth four days ago and nobody told me about this. Um, and yeah, basically you just need to know about cord blood banking as an option. Like the fact that you can freeze your umbilical cord and placenta for its stem cells is something so powerful and so underestimated. Like I said, like most placentas and umbilical cords are just thrown away and birth mm -hmm. is such a frenzy. Um, so yeah, I think that's just really important for parents to know about. Mm -hmm. Do, does Andra Health work with any advocacy groups or anything to ideally hopefully get those other states on board with making sure that they educate every single parent that that's an option for them? No, we actually don't, but we, we should. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> just my two cents. <laughs> um, but we definitely work with a lot of providers like mm -hmm. doulas, OBGYNs, midwives, mm -hmm. so that they personally feel conviction about informing parents. Um, like I think more than anything, it's, yeah, really important that providers have that information as well because they're informing a lot of decisions that pregnant parents are making. Um, so yeah, in even in the 31 states, like there's no way to know um, if providers are actually informing pregnant parents of like the fact that they can freeze their umbilical cord and placenta for its stem cells. Um, so yeah, more than anything, I think it's important that OBGYNs, midwives, doulas, childbirth educators, L&D nurses, anyone that touches birth professionally mm -hmm. knows about the fact that you can, yeah, freeze your umbilical cord and placenta for its stem cells because 
Um, yeah, every little thing counts when you're guiding a parent's birth. Um, so yeah, it's just important that they know about that. Cool. So you mentioned you had some providers on your team. How involved are they and how do they help you as a founder and CEO of this company make decisions? Yeah, so we have a medical director um, and we have three uh, medical advisors. So two OBGYNs and a doula. Um, and basically, whenever we have parents come to us with medically related questions, for instance, like we've had parents come to us with like, I have HIV, should I bank? Um, then yeah, we can walk that walk through that with our medical director, for instance. Um, we also have parents that come to us with like, my son just got diagnosed with X disease. Like I just saved my baby stem cells with you all. Like, should we consider stem cells as an option? Similarly, we have our medical director as a resource for that. Um, and just in general, I think, yeah, having like OBGYN backing for a lot of what we do and making sure that, for instance, our blogs can be medically reviewed and that we're putting out evidence-based information is really important. So, um, yeah, we look a lot as well to organizations like Evidence-Based Birth um, because there's a lot of misinformation in the birth space. So mm -hmm. we really try to make sure that everything is like medically backed and involved uh, with physicians and providers. Good. <laughs> That's great. Um, I had another question. What was I going to ask? Um, oh, is Anja, is Anja Health involved in any research on the potential for stem cells, or are you mostly just on the banking side of things? Yeah, right now we're mostly on the banking side of things, but I think in the future it would be awesome if we could be involved with more of the research side. Um, when we have parents retrieve stem cells, we definitely try to continue to stay up to date with how their progress is going. And in general, we try to keep tabs on the industry and progressions happening in stem cell research. Um, so yeah, that's definitely something in the next like year or two I'd really love to get more deeply involved in. Right now we're just kind of focused on building up the business related to, yeah, cryopreservation. But um, yeah, beyond that, we, yeah, do want to, yeah, wait, I lost my train of thought, but I feel like that's good. <laughs> yeah, it's about research. So Anja Health has a TikTok, and you said that was an interesting experience starting that. How did you gain a following, decide to start the account? Yeah, so I got on TikTok because when I was doing my consultancy bridge strategy, I basically advised all companies to get on TikTok. Like, it just makes sense that companies should be on TikTok. The discoverability on the For You page is literally unlike any other platform. Um, and you're literally consuming content that you would want to see. So I think it's just like such a powerful social media platform. Um, and so, yeah, because I had always advised other businesses to get on TikTok as a consultant to other businesses, um, I wanted for my company to also get on TikTok. So like pretty much like when I quit my job and decided I was gonna found Angel Health, I remember on a Monday, I literally woke up I got on a couple calls with supply chain partners as I was setting up the supply chain. And then I'd spend the rest of the day making TikToks. I just like studied trends in the pregnancy space. Um, I looked into, yeah, I, I tried, I A-B tested like a variety of phrases to explain the concept of cord blood banking because it's so complicated. And even that phrase itself, a lot of parents like don't even grasp what it means. Mm -hmm. Even those that know what it is, like, yeah, sometimes they'll be like blood cord banking or whatever. So it's very... It's just very, um, yeah, kind of like uh, hard to understand. So I wanted to figure out what the best language was on social media for me to demystify it as a concept. Um, so yeah, so I started making TikToks and I pretty much for eight months, I posted eight times a day. Wow. Um, and I just like did everything I could to try and like understand what pregnant parents are really looking for on social media. Um, and I still don't think I'm like per se the best at it, but, um, but it was definitely a really powerful experience because I could see like very immediate feedback in my comments, um, and things like that from parents. And that was really powerful, especially if I even made a comment about like being positive about your stretch marks or anything like that. And then a parent would be like, you made me feel so much better. So that kind of stuff was really rewarding. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, we've gotten a lot of like really cool reach um, with TikTok. And yeah, now I have around like 150,000 followers. So um, that's really cool. And I definitely hope that TikTok doesn't get banned. <laughs> 
So I was going to say, so that's a lot of followers. How did you gain such a following? Um, I think it was because I posted eight times a day for eight months. Mm -hmm. Um, and like throughout that process, I really wanted to, um, yeah, I, I just wanted to like be, yeah, really engaged with what was happening on TikTok and like really deeply understand our end user, mm -hmm. um, and like what kind of content they wanted to consume. So yeah, I just studied a lot of trends and like things that they were looking into and, um, would listen to like feedback in the comments and things like that. Um, and yeah, I think if I had more personal content up there, I think that would be like maybe a bit better for my engagement, but it's like hard for me to sort of drop the veil online. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, I, I feel like, um, yeah, it's just like harder for me to, to do that. That's fair. So <laughs> in the case that you didn't have TikTok, what, how would you reach your potential customers? Yeah, if we didn't have TikTok, I would reach our customers through providers first um, and then probably through other social media channels. Like, mm -hmm. I think even if TikTok gets banned, um, like regardless, parents will continue to search for information online. Um, so it's just a matter of finding where they live. Um, and also, yeah, I think the I think TikTok has changed the way that people consume content. Like short form video is not going to go away, even if TikTok does. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's just a matter of then finding like where people are consuming the short form content and continuing that. Um, but yeah, we're actually trying to now shift more towards long form content because I think um, engagement there is much, much better. Like YouTubers have basically YouTube's like a hundred thousand YouTube subscribers is worth way more than like a hundred thousand TikTok followers. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, they're the fans and followers t typically tend to be like really engaged and committed and they can develop like a stronger parasocial relationship. So if you can nail long form content and get people to engage with you, even spend like five, more than five minutes of their day with just you, um, then like that's really, really powerful and speaks to the fact that content is really, really quality. So we're now striving to have like really high quality content, which is why we do this recording here. And um, yeah, just making sure that the parents feel like we're worth watching. Mm -hmm. I had a question. This is back to other like business <coughs> things. <clears throat> so does uh, blood cord banking exist elsewhere in the world? Or is it mostly yeah. in the United States? Yeah, so cord blood banking exists in uh, pretty much every country, or I, I don't, I don't want to say every country, but like in every developed country, like every developed nation, like in Europe, it tends to be like a, a more common. Um, and actually in Singapore and China as well, is where, in Singapore, China and Portugal is where rates of cord, cord blood banking is really, really high. So about 10% of parents in Portugal and about 30% of parents in uh, Singapore, and then up to like seven to 10% of parents in different areas of China bank their baby's stem cells from their umbilical cord and placenta and freeze them for later future disease treatment. So um, yeah, it is more common than in the US. In the US, it's only 2% of parents that do this. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's just largely because of like, um, yeah, a variety of reasons in each country. But I think in Singapore, for sure, it's at 30% because parents get a stipend when they're uh, having a kid. So they feel more financial freedom with their decisions to make uh, decisions like saving stem cells. So um, yeah, our goal is to get that number in the US to 10%. Nice. Do you see Andra Health moving internationally? Yeah, I've actually had like quite a few discussions with folks about um, moving internationally and where where we should, things like that. Um, we have done Canada in the past. Now we're just focusing on the U.S., mm -hmm. um, but we have gotten orders from Canada. Um, we've got also gotten orders from like really remote countries. We've had a few from India as well, um, just because I think like people will see my content on TikTok and assume it's international. Um, we've gotten orders from Australia too. Um, so yeah, but wherever you are, if you search cord blood banking on Google, like if you're in a developed nation, pretty much you probably have a cord blood bank in your country. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that usually <coughs> there's, usually there's a tenure of, you can freeze for 20 years. Could you do pass then? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, if you want to freeze more than 20 years, then, um, we can definitely, arrange for that. You can choose to renew, um, very upfront with us. Like when you first bank with us, you can also opt for like lifetime plans or anything like that. Um, so that 
you are set for life. And so lifetime basically qualifies 72 years of storage. Um, so yeah, you can definitely extend and continue to renew. Mm -hmm. Is there any chance that the storage may go wrong or if there's an error in the lab, um, what is a parent supposed to do then? Yeah, so um, our lab is ABB accredited and FDA approved, and our um, lab director is runs a very tight ship because he actually used to be um, with the ABB assessing lab. So yeah, he very closely monitors everything that happens in the lab and makes sure that it's up to protocol and also the best protocol for processing, for instance, to maximize stem cell collection. Um, so yeah, they're like generators, backup generators, et cetera, to make sure that nothing happens. Um, but yeah, we do have insurance and guarantees, quality guarantees, for instance. So um, yeah, that's something that parents can keep in mind when looking at banks like us. So there's this myth that people say that if you eat your placenta, that it could be beneficial for your health. Mm -hmm. Would you be able to do that with the umbilical cord? <laughs> No, and if if you're thinking about eating your placenta, I really don't think you should. Uh, it's just my my personal opinion, but I mean, we're all for like just informing parents mm -hmm. and arming them with knowledge, and then they can decide what to do from there. Um, but yeah, I personally wouldn't do it. Uh, from what I've seen, there really isn't a lot of research backing eating your own placenta. Um, so we don't offer it as a service at Angel Health with your umbilical cord or placenta. Um, and I think a lot of people want to eat their placenta because they think it's like a cool wellness hack and like celebrities do it. But mm -hmm. if you actually, I feel like what put eating placentas on the map is an episode of Keeping Up with the Kardashians where Kim jokes about eating her placenta. And in the promo, it obviously looks like she's eating her placenta. But if you actually watch the episode, none of them end up eating it because they all think it's gross. <laughs> and like parents have gotten like in infections and like literally passed away from consuming their own placenta because you're basically consuming a dead organ um that's been like processed and some people put spices on it and whatever but um yeah there's very little evidence backing any of it and some people think that it can treat like postpartum depression anxiety and that's like a really really common problem um so, yeah, I think parents are, like, willing to try anything in those cases. But mm -hmm. I think if you are looking for solutions related to postpartum depression and anxiety, then um, mental health-related solutions like a therapist or anything like that or finding community would be a, a better and probably more beneficial one. That's good to know. Won't do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so let's say I'm not looking to bank any cord blood anytime soon <laughs> but is there anything that I should know then before I go into a pregnancy um expecting myself to do that yeah so if you're not pregnant now but you just want to keep us in mind I would honestly just follow Angel Health on social media so that you know um where to find us when the time comes so yeah we're at angel health on pretty much everything except on instagram or angel dot health but um yeah we yeah we we actually have quite a few people that have reached out about that it's kind of interesting like i've, I've gotten quite a few comments on tiktok along the lines of like i followed you just so that i don't forget to do this but like i'm not even like like i'm totally single yeah. I, I have no plans to have a kid soon <laughs> Um, so yeah, we just try to be top of mind for parents. Um, and I would just say, continue to share the information with other people, you know, that are pregnant. Mm -hmm. Like I said, in 31 States, it's a legal mandate that pregnant parents are informed of cord blood banking as an option. And so, um, yeah, I think if, even if you're not pregnant, you can just share the information that you can freeze your umbilical cord and placenta for its stem cells. And yeah, that's all you, all you have to do. Uh, are there any privacy protections? Um, what's it, what are, like? Are there any privacy protection procedures at Angel Health? Yeah, yeah, for sure. We are HIPAA compliant um, because we do collect sensitive information. So, for instance, we have a parent form that parents first um, fill out when they onboard with us, and that includes a lot of medical history related questions. It's very similar to like if you donate blood, they ask you a variety of questions. So, because mm -hmm. you're also giving a blood sample for a potential future transplant or transfusion. Um, we ask a very similar set of questions around like, have you been exposed to like XX virus? Have you traveled 
to like this country between these years um, and things like that. So yeah, that information is protected by HIPAA. So we do what we can infrastructurally to make sure that data is protected. Okay, what's like what's one fun thing that you would like your audience or customers to know about you? Um, probably I feel like that I have a personality because <laughs> I feel like I feel like on TikTok I spend a lot of time making content that's like if you're pregnant, just mm-hmm. so you know, like you're pumping forty percent more blood throughout your body, so that's why you're out of breath. And mm-hmm. um, I'm just like a fax machine, mm-hmm. uh, like F A C T S machine, and. Um, and yeah, just pumping out information about pregnancy and umbilical cords and placenta. Um, and yeah, so, but I think I would want my followers to know that, yeah, that I have personality and interests and things like that outside of umbilical cords <laughs> and placentas. So yeah, for instance, we used to have a fashion podcast. Um, back in the day, that was a good a hobby that's still in existence at Statement Peace Pod. And <laughs> I've actually also dabbled in pretty much every form of social media. Mm-hmm. So that's why I think it's actually really fitting that a lot of what I do at Angel Health now is social media related because I've always loved social media. Like I twi- I streamed on Twitch every day for one hour for a month just to try it. I've like, I had a YouTube channel. I did Vlogmas. <laughs> I literally posted vlogs like all the time. Um, for a short period, usually I'll just, I'll try it. Mm. Um, I, yeah, I used to model. So I love like being an Insta <laughs> thought. <laughs> um, and yeah, I just like have a lot of interest, I guess, outside of my company. But I think at the end of the day, because we're, we get comments like you made me feel more confident about my stretch marks or what have you. That mm-hmm. kind of stuff is so rewarding for me that like my main priority when it comes to social media work and anything like that is for my business. Um, but yeah, but there's more to me than that. How, how would you say you keep your life balanced? I keep my life balanced by socializing a lot. Um, like I try, I, I'm super extroverted. I gain, gain a lot of energy from chatting with others. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also do my best to protect my peace and make sure that um, there's a sense of balance in terms of like, I am like working enough, but not too much and not burning out. Like I've definitely experienced burnout as well. So um, yeah, I think my friends and travel are the biggest things that keep me from burning out. Um, because yeah, I love to travel. I've been to like 51 countries. Um, and I think it's just like a really good way to gain new perspective and like refresh your thoughts. Even when it comes to my business, like when I travel, Mm -hmm. I always think of new things like as I'm traveling, just because I have like a different sense of brain space. So I think that's a really good way to like keep your brain, um, like evolving basically and like shape, shape, shift your brain. Do you have any health hacks? Um, yeah, I have health hacks. So yeah, I have an aura ring. I love my aura ring. I wear it every day. I love to track my sleep. Um, I recently did a body fat scan. So I feel like that was really informative. A trainer walked me through my body fat scan and basically told me that my trunk and arms need to be stronger and my legs are strong enough. Um, but he recommended weight lifting three times a week and doing cardio for at least 30 to 40 minutes. Um, like two or three times a week as well. So I do, I just started doing 12, 330, which actually keeps my heart rate above 150 BPM. So I think that's really effective cardio workout. Um, and I just, I have been using chat GBT to create a lift uh, protocol for me. So I also track um, my lifting schedule on a spreadsheet so that I can see like that I'm actually increasing weight um, every time I go to the gym. So I do try to increase it and then I eat protein after um, and try to, yeah, reduce exposure to like fried foods and sugar and like just like the typical wellness things. And I, I think you have really good sleep health. Yeah, well, I feel like, yeah, sleep is really important to me because I used to have seizures that mm-hmm. are related to sleep or like lack of sleep. Um, and so I, yeah, do my best to make sure that I'm sleeping enough. Like I have an air purifier that I turn on for white noise purposes, but also to keep the air clean. I always wear an eye mask to sleep because like light can disturb your sleep. Um, I have like a di- like different set of like earplugs and things like this if I'm like in a loud place. Um, 
to make sure that noise doesn't disturb me. And yeah, I track my sleep on my aura ring. As soon as I get up, I pretty much look at my sleep score. So I think, um, yeah, that's really important. Very nice. Well, it was great to talk to you today, Catherine. Great to hear about the company and how you got here. Yes, thank you so much for interviewing me. And yeah, shout out to the Better Birth Podcast. <laughs>